I don't think I've been in Copley Formal Lounge with this many people before, so uh, it's great to have everyone here. And at least it's not 110 degrees outside, so you can, you can breathe the air with this many people, which is very nice to do. Uh, welcome to our talk. My name is Sonal Shah. I am the executive director of the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. And I want to first take a moment to uh, thank all of our, co to our two co-sponsors. Uh, is anybody here from the Lecture Fund? The Student Lecture Fund, I know there's a bunch of volunteers. They're all volunteering. That's probably why they're up there. Uh, and then the Net Impact Club. Is anybody here from the Net Impact Club? And they're also volunteering. So stand up. Come on, don't feel bad. Um, thank you all for co-sponsoring with us. It's really great to have you. And please do recognize them. Don't, uh, don't be shy. And they've been invaluable in guiding our work. I also want to just thank the Beck Center staff. So if all of you could just stand for a second. I know these things always seem easy, but everybody spends a lot of time pulling together, uh, pulling together events. So I really want to thank them. And then we have a group of senior fellows that work with us uh, that range from folks in finance to civil society to art artists. And we have a lot of them here. So I want all of our senior fellows to stand up. Um, and then finally, I, I, you know, I'm so excited to have Anand here today. Uh, his last name is Girdardas. I got it. I practiced on it in the proper way. It's because your dad actually said it on the phone today, so I actually uh, yeah. spent time figuring that out. But uh, even Indian people need help from other Indian people. For this name. <laughs> no. I know Shah. Just, know. just comparison you had it very wise. Easy. You had it very easy. It's, <laughs> But you know, what's, what's great, and what's great to have on in here, it's very funny. I co-hosted a talk of your first book, um, India in Calling, in at a bar in DC. And we had about 150 people there. It was really great to have you. So it's been great to have this relationship with you over the years. And I also know his wife. Actually, I think I know your wife before I knew you, mm -hmm. uh, Priya, who also has a book uh, that has come out called The Art of Gathering. Um, and it was, it's been great to see them evolve both individually, which I've known them individually, but also now collectively, and with two kids. <laughs> and uh, it's, been, it's been great to see him from his time in India to the book that he wrote to being a New York Times reporter, and it's been, uh, it's been great to have him come. So we're very excited to have him here. Very excited about the conversation that he is focusing on forcing all of us to have. Right? Can elites change the world? Are we looking at market pressures and market solutions, and is that enough? Are we holding ourselves accountable when things don't work as much as when things do work? And do we continue to perpetuate the same things over and over again if we are not willing to question? Why this, question, this conversation matters at Georgetown is this is the whole point of discernment. If we talk about discernment, and we're not thinking about how do you discern, how do you reflect, how do you think about these questions, this book makes us think that way. I didn't invite him here because I agree with everything. I invited him here because I think this conversation is super important. It's a super important conversation for us to be having. It's a super conversation for our students to be thinking about as you think about your careers and the things you want to do, the things you will do, the things you have done. It's super important for the community, for all of us that participate in this process of figuring out social change and thinking about social change. It's an important conversation to have. So before we get started, I want to give you uh, just two minutes on the Beck Center. We were started six years ago at Georgetown University with the idea of thinking about how does government, civil society, and the private sector come together to think about solutions. We do not believe any one of those is alone an answer. I've worked in government. I worked 12 years of my career in government, eight of them in a, as a civil servant, uh, four of them in the Obama administration as a political appointee. And it comes with an understanding that government has a lot to do and we need to have government that can work, but it also comes from an understanding that government alone can't solve this problem because it needs civil society to step up. It needs society to step in. It also needs a business sector that wants to work with it. All of these solutions by themselves, whether it's climate change, whether it's a healthcare crisis, whether it's education, alone are not an answer for any one of these groups, and neither one of the, any of these groups can operate independently. Why you need the private sector is actually, frankly, innovation comes from there. 
government's not going to innovate. They can fund innovation, but they can't innovate. They can scale innovation. And you need civil society to hold both of those equally accountable. And that's why we exist. We look for those ideas, those solutions, those conversations that can push that. And that's what the Beck Center does. So we, we invest in students that think about social impact. We want students to learn about what is social impact, how do you live it, how do you work at it, how do you discern it, how do you think about it, and then how do you practice it. And that is what um, our role is, that is what our job on the campus is. It is how we think about social impact on a constant basis, and we think about what do you scale? If you want to scale social impact, how do you think about it? Should policy change? Is it just about large organizations? Because I don't think that's the solution either. Or is it about policy change? Or is it about civil society acting? Is it about a movement that needs to get created because we need collective change? These are questions that we have to ask ourselves, and these are questions we ask ourselves on a regular basis. So with that, um, Anand, I really want to have this conversation with you, and it's been gr thank you for coming, first of all. I see thank that you, for having me. Uh, you have, I know you have two kids. One is three and a half, and the other is eight months, so which means you don't get a lot of sleep. Correct. So the fact that you're still As someone awake, said to me in the signing line yesterday, politics and prose, you have very red eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was leavened by the next person in line said, can you make my book out to, uh, can you sign it for uh, Gala, G-A-L-A, -A, which is really appropriate when you're writing a book about uh, rich people trying to save the world. And I said, is that because that's what you do? And she said, yeah, I, I organize galas. She's like, but it's also my name. <laughs> so, I forgot about the red eye thing. <laughs> Can't make fun of it too much, right? Um, OK, so let's, not everybody's read the book yet. Uh, first of all, there are books on sale, and Anand will be doing a signing. So feel free to go buy a book, and then also be ready for the signing afterwards. Um, what prompted this book? Like, why now? You know, you've lived, a, a, one could argue, a storied life. You've been at the New York Times, you've written books, you were Aspen, you've been on Morning Joe, uh, you're still on Morning Joe. <laughs> uh, you've been at McKinsey, why now? I started to be bothered by, over not overnight, over a long period of time, and I actually went back and I wrote a column in 2011 in the New York Times called Real Change Requires Politics, which mm -hmm. is actually a fairly good summary of this book. Um, many years before I started writing it. Um, but I think I was bothered by the following paradox that many of us will recognize. By any stretch of the imagination, we live in a, an almost heroically generous time. Um, more money being given away at this very moment than ever in history. And every day, there's like some new person with a lot of money who's deciding how to throw it at us. Um, and, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, like every young person on a campus like this, not every, but most, want to change the world and want to do, do great things for a lot of people. And that's why you have centers like this that, that help them with that desire. Um, you can't go shopping without encountering a tote bag that's going to change the world, and an iPhone case that's going to change the world. And Tom, Sh and we can laugh, and I kind of laugh, but also, like, these are very smart people who figured out that that's something people really want now. Um, $410 billion given away the last year or the year before, right? A, a, an amount of private giving on public problems that is starting to approach the level of non-military discretionary government spending. So we almost have this emergent fourth branch of government um, that's obviously unelected and, and motivated by this you know, generosity to help people and maybe do some other stuff. Um, so you have that fact of heroic generosity. But this also happens to be um, the worst, you know, 30, over the last 30, 40 years, it's become the worst time to be a working or middle class American in a long time. Uh, we're as unequal as we've been in 100 years. A lot of serious people think this level of inequality leads to you know, riots at a minimum and world wars uh, you know, in, in many cases. Um, we clearly have a politics that proves to us that uh, an enormous number of things are broken. Um, I don't think you get a Donald Trump without like 18 uncorrelated parallel system failures at the same time of various types of things. 
Um, and so I just became very interested and bothered by this paradox of how is it that we live in an age that is so generous, so awash in this kindness, in which I don't think there's a single major company that doesn't have CSR giving or a foundation or something. And yet at the same time, um, an, an elite that in many ways has been very predatory in terms of the system they uphold. I mean, this week is the 10th anniversary of the financial crisis. Um, you know, the bottom 90% of Americans are still poorer than they were in 2007. All of the gains of the recovery have gone to the top 10% of Americans, and most of them to the top slice of that, right? That is predation. That is not, that didn't happen the way weather happens. That was organized and designed and fought for and lobbied for. So we have to, I just became very consumed by this question of what is the relationship between all this elite helpfulness and all this elite hoarding? And there's a couple possibilities. One possibility is the elites are doing the best they can. They're helping as fast as they can, but the problems are too big. They can't move the needle fast enough. That's a possibility. Um, another possibility is that um, you know, they, are, they are doing things that, as you kind of indicated, are experiments, and maybe they could be scaled up, and the scaling is not happening. Um, but I think a more sinister possibility that I began to consider is that this helpfulness, in some ways, is part of the system that allows the hoarding to happen. Um, that the giving is actually kind of a lubricant in the engine of continued taking, and the making a difference is part of how they protect the opportunity to keep making a killing. And I decided to do some reporting on it, which is what I do. And I spent time with these people. And I, and I, you know, I tried not to um, throw rocks from outside. Like I went into these spaces, and I spent time with people. And I tried to understand their lives from a cockpit view of how they see the world, what they're trying to do, how they're trying to do good in different ways. And I think my, my conclusion after a few years of doing that reporting was that when the, a great many rich and powerful people move into the space of social change, because of who they are, because of their resources and power, they can't help but have a big impact on the space just by showing up. They're not people in the back of the room. right? They're not just writing anonymous checks online and like submitting their check. When they come into social change, they inevitably end up in the front row. They inevitably end up on the board. They, they can't help but, or, or maybe they could help, but they, they don't. They, they become in charge of social change. Uh, you know, uh, I love this verb. I mean, there's a lot of Columbusing of social change that ends up happening. Um, so you have Bain and company, which is like not in the social change business. It gets into the social, it adds a social sector practice. And the, from the beginning that it's announcing its social sector practices, our aim is to transform the whole social sector. Wow. You weren't even here last year. You're going to transform the, and there's a lot of that, right? So what I started to realize is as the winners of our age move into the space of social change and become interested in solving these problems, motivated as they are by the economic and inequality that I talked about, they often end up redefining change. They're not simply joining a static thing. They're changing it by joining it. And they change it in a particular way, which is they defang change. They push for the kind of change that doesn't change their world. They push for the kind of change that protects their opportunity to stand at the top of the system. So, so let me push you on that, though, for a second, right? Because I, um, I think one of the questions I, one could argue um, that it is a lots of, it's complicated, right? Change is complicated. Um, I've worked in government. I've worked in the nonprofit sector, started a nonprofit. Um, it is hard to get people to change. So what happens from what I see from a lot of people is they pick the thing they know how to do, and they just keep doing that over and over. So whether it might be obeying what their consulting practice or whether it might be um, anyone with their piece of the CSR pie, um, it's, it's oh, systems change is hard to understand. And I trust me, I try to explain it to people, and people look at me like I've got seven heads. Um, how do you think about that? Like, how do you explain to people a complicated idea such as systems change when the easiest thing to think about is I can join that company and work on the social sector? Yeah, I mean, I, I think 
there's a lot of things going on here. And certainly one of the things going on is these issues are hard. But as I actually did the reporting and spent time in these spaces, it became very clear that it's, it's not only that it's hard, right? Um, I mean, you did some of this very good work at Goldman, for example. Like, my experience of that world is very different from my experience of Silicon Valley. When I, the people I know at Goldman who talk to me privately about their motivation set, it's pretty clear what Goldman is motivated by. Yeah. I don't think the stuff, the good stuff you did is core to what they're trying to do yeah. in the world. I think in that case, the good stuff is the lubricant of the engine to keep being Goldman, right? So there, I don't think it's an issue of, gosh, it's so hard to change systems. I don't think Goldman wants to change the system. Okay? I'll, so I'll push you on that, right? Because um, I, we worked at, well, I was at Goldman, most largely building their environmental strategy, right? I didn't actually work on everything else. Um, but we actually worked on trying to get legislation passed. And we had like 10, 15 companies bought in to, to pass legislation on climate change, actually a carbon tax. And society didn't want it. The voters didn't vote for it. They didn't vote their congressmen in. How do you think about it from that perspective? Because it wasn't that Goldman didn't think about that problem. I'm not saying they didn't think about the other problems. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna argue for that uh, because at the end of the day, they make money on trading. Um, but I will say they did try to change legislation. Yeah, but I think part of the thing is what, a lot of things I write about in the book are individual acts that at the margin make things better than not doing them. So that is absolutely an example of something that is, is it better to have done that than not? It sounds like yes. Um, or you know, that was a maybe a lobbying thing, but even if it's a if it's a program or it's feeding people, my concern is what is any institution's full role in the system? Okay, because if you are pushing for a law on climate change, that's awesome. Okay, but if your behavior, if you're a tr trading company, that I don't know how much they spend, a couple million, ten million. I mean, not a lot in the grand scheme of Goldman's effect on the world. If in everything else you are doing you are pushing for a kind of capitalism that forces companies to pursue profit to the edge of their horizon, including, I mean, they've been, you know, Goldman specifically has recommended Exxon stock for many, many years, and there's a whole dispute around that. Like, if you are also doing that, my guess is your net effect on the world on that issue is not made up, is not, yeah. is not, is not put into the black, um, by the good environmental thing you did. That's my concern, that a lot of the winners of our age, it's not that they're not doing good, it's not that they don't have an intention to make change, but they fight, end up fighting on both sides of many wars. Sure. And so another example, I love this story. Someone, someone told me the story of this woman who now works for George Soros. She used to work at a major consulting firm, and corporate consulting firm, and she, you know, this consulting firm's gotten very big on this idea of uh, empowering women is a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. It used to just be the right thing to do, but these days that's not a very compelling argument. Um, so you gotta put trillion in social justice things to really motivate people. Um, presumably you don't need that to motivate women, but I guess men need the trillion. Um, so, so a report was put out saying, you know, uh, empower women, make, make your trillions. And this, this, I think she was in her like mid-20s at the time, most junior person in this room. She said, you know, I mean, it's great that we're doing this report, right? But um, we advise like half the Fortune 500, right? What if we just told our, advised our clients, if we really believe in this report, it's a very passionately written report, what if we just advised all of our clients to, um, to seize all lobbying activities currently underway against maternity leave and childcare policies that make it very hard for women to play their multiple roles in life. Like, what if we just didn't ask them to like, do anything special and new, just ask them to stop things they're in the middle of doing now that we know that they're in the middle of doing. And all these people in the consulting firm looked at her like, are you crazy? Who hired this woman? And she's now at a philanthropy. Um, <laughs> she's not there anymore. And, and I think my, there, there are absolutely people on both other extremes that, I, that I'm not really talking about in this book. There are people like the Koch brothers who are not trying to do good and are very clear about trying to capture the government to deregulate their businesses. And that's not doing good by doing well. And there are people who are making um, system change. And that's great, but I think they're a very small minority in this space. And what I became interested in are the people who are trying to do 
do good, but insist on doing well as part of the package, and who therefore end up, as I say, fighting both sides of the conflict. So, so let me dig into that piece, because I think you, a lot of your conversation is around the market world, which you can define, uh, which you will define, but um, that is, the, it's this group of people who think about doing good by doing well, or doing well by doing good. Um, give us a little bit of that, of that critique. So, so I mean, I'll say, just to step even behind that, one of the things I learned a long time ago, just about writing, which I think is interesting, is, you know, if, if I was like a travel writer going to Antarctica telling you news from Antarctica, I'm like, I would be bringing you things that you didn't know very easily, so you don't need to, you can just say what happened. But if you're taking, with something like this book, I'm presenting to people a reality that they know. And I'm trying to actually make you look again at things you know. You all laughed about the tote bag that changes the world, not because you don't know that, but because you do, right? Um, and so, when, as a writer, you are trying to take, to defamiliarize the familiar, coinage is a very powerful tool. Um, and so what I wanted to do, so I coined this word market world, which is one word, capital M, capital W, for hashtag purposes. Um, <laughs> um, and what I tried to do, I wanted to scoop together into a single reality that we could then talk about, a bunch of things that I, that I think are not seen as being together, okay? So I'll give you an example of some of these phenomenon that I think we think of as separate phenomenon that I wanted to scoop together. Um, so, sitting here, young people in their senior year of college who wanna change the world and end up at Goldman Sachs, right? Big drama, like half the room has grappled with that, is grappling with that like right now or whatever. Um, but I also wanna deal with something very different from that, which is like, what should Jeff Bezos do with his money? Now, those don't seem exactly like the same thing, but I, I, th and my, I want to argue that they're part of the same thing. And then you take the question of like the conference circuit, and what effect does the like TED and Davos sponsorship of ideas, Aspen ideas, what effect does that have on what ideas get boosted and what ideas get left out? Um, again, that doesn't seem exactly related to like big philanthropy or campus co-opting of idealism, but, but. I wanted to suggest it as part of a piece. And then you have you know, the whole Bain thing we talked Like, What happens when the business mind comes to be viewed as the only mind or the most capable mind at solving social problems? As you and I were talking earlier, a lot of people in nonprofits now insist that you have, you have to work in the private sector to be able to be in the nonprofit like or in government or whatever. <laughs> right. And so like, again, that's a totally different story than the other three I mentioned. I wanted to scoop all of this together. And sort, of pr and sort of look at what I, so I coined market world as this kind of complex of people and institutions who in different ways, I think, participate in this ideology of making the world a better place in ways that fundamentally protect the system atop which they stand. Um, and it takes many manifestations. And for example, and the pieces work together so that one of the, the underlying conclusions of the book is that I think we live in an age where decent people, these winners that I'm writing about, decent people in general uphold an indecent system. It'd be easy if it was indecent people upholding an indecent system. These are not um, you know, the villains of like a medieval feudal movie where they're like whipping the people on the manor. You know, these are people who are trying to make things better and in my view have a more complicated relationship to that than they realize. And so how do you get decent people upholding an indecent system? Well, they need to be able to feel like the things that they do are real change even when they're not. Well, that requires thinkers, right? They can't just do that themselves. They need justifications, they need rationalizations, and they can't cook those up themselves. That's not really their job. So, so part of where the TED and Davos conference sphere and the lecture circuit and all these things, which I also write about, Again, that may seem to be very unrelated from this, but I actually think it's a very crucial part of supplying the winners of our age with ideas that allow them to feel like they're making change when they're not. And so just to take one example, to go back to that women and trillion issue, you know, it's pretty clear from a lot of other countries that it, social policy on family leave, maternity leave, childcare, and a bunch of things, actually moves the needle in terms of changing women's labor participation rate. Um, we know that, everybody, you know, 
rich people know that, poor people know that. I mean, but that's very expensive. That's real money, right? Not trillions, but billions. And so what happens is thinkers who don't talk about that, but who do tell you to lean in, or to have mentorship circles, these ideas that have the great benefit of being free, <laughs> because they impose the entire cost on women themselves to uh, you know, outmaneuver sexism, um, these ideas become very popular. So a TED Talk or a Davos panel on like cool things women can do to outfox sexism will just have a power and a patronage in market world that an idea like why we should have a, you know, a tax on short selling to fund daycare is just like not going to have that viral TED talk. Right. And so, so that's, I mean, so that's a, um, a very interesting, like, I, I remember you, I think in the book, also talk about Amy Cuddy in this, which is, um, uh, she wrote, her, her viral TED talk was on the power poses for women, right? right? And so I, I find this um, super interesting, because there is this kind of interesting question and viral world that we all live in that becomes circular after a while, right? Which is, in order for you to get attention, you have to do X. In order for the journalism, the journalist to pick up any story, you have to do Y. And we're all trying to get attention for our ideas. Amy Cuddy was trying to get actually a attention for her ideas for women's <laughs> equality. Correct. Ended up having to write and about And when she said poses, all that critical stuff, nobody wanted when to she hear talked it. about patriarchy, she never got asked to give one talk outside academia. Right. So what is that? What is that system that, why is it the journalists don't pick it up? You've, you've been a journalist. Why is it that they don't pick up the, the big issues, but are only focusing on the things that make women look cool? Um, but not the things that women want to fight about. I think Amy's story is like such a useful one. So you, some of you may have seen her talk. This is power poses. You know, Amy. One of the things that I really grew from in this book is actually spending time with. I didn't write about a million people. I wrote about. I interviewed a lot of people, but I but I really wrote about like nine or ten yeah. people in depth. And each chapter is generally one person, or sometimes two. And the advantage of that is. The conversation we're having is a conversation about ideas, just because that's like what you do when you talk about something on a stage. But the book is actually entirely about people yes. navigating these things and just like the like riding in a limousine with the head of the Ford Foundation, or like figure out what he's gonna say at an event and then what he ends up actually saying. And you know, it's a, it's very nuanced. And and with Amy, it was really an education for me in how complicated it is to navigate this choice of speaking truth to power. So basically, she wrote paper after paper, taking on systems of sexism and prejudice for a long time, none of which are famous, none of which you may have heard of, none of which, you know, unless you work on that issue, and none of which got her an invitation outside the halls of academia. No one cared. The papers are great. No one cared. Um, my favorite p paper of hers that no one cared about outside of academia was a paper where she proved uh, with some colleagues that in cultures where being independent is the highest value, like America, men are uh, cast as independent and women as interdependent. In cultures like South Korea, which is the other place they study, where it's reversed and being interdependent is the highest value, lo and behold, women are cast as selfish and independent and men are interdependent and other oriented, right? So basically, whatever is valued, women are not that. Um, <laughs> like, that's a really, that's not a good TED talk in the sense that that's like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, that like your sponsors may walk out. So, um, so she did that kind of work, and then she did this one. The power pose research is, you know, I don't think she thought of it as particularly special. It was one thing among many things she did, and the title of the talk was like neuroendocrine levels, blah blah. blah. I mean, it, the first words of the title were neuroendocrine levels, right? I mean, this was not aimed at virality, to be really clear. Um, it got scooped up by I don't know what the chain was, but it got scooped up by people who saw in it this potential. And what they saw in it was different from what she intended. I mean, it was a right. talk that proved a certain thesis that you do these power poses, it can have you know, hormonal effects on people and increase confidence and whatever. Well, the interesting thing is often how people in market world read something like that. And I think if I were to translate how they read something like that, it was like, wow, here is a much cheaper way to empower women <laughs> that anybody can do now. At, and it's a win-win, right? 
Procter and Gamble, I'm making this up, but Procter and Gamble, if they wanted, could like, okay, we're gonna do power poses up and down the company, right? You record a video, a couple thousand bucks, you record a video, you roll it out, send it to everybody in the, your, in the company email, and then you say, you know, we should be empowered now. Don't have to change practices, you know, the gropers can stay on in the firm, like everything's good. Um, so, so she at that point, as when that got scooped up, yeah. she didn't do that. Like that was, yeah. right? She had to then decide, do I play into this or not? And she fought it for a really long time. And she would then use the fame, she gave the talk, it got popular, but she kept, and she would use the fame, she'd go to these spaces and be like, you know, Harvard, like advanced uh, MBA, like advanced, whatever that thing is called, advanced uh, MBA, yeah, yeah, executive education. Like a lot of men from around the world um, and you know, she would she'd go in that space and be like, look guys, the problem with sexism is like, you guys are sexist, <laughs> right? And these men would be like, she's, Amy's I'm literally a body language <laughs> expert. She was like, it's really awkward and you're a body language expert and it's like 100 men being like this, you know? Um, <laughs> that particular one was also during the World Cup finals and a lot of those guys were from countries that are like very big soccer places. So it was a tough, tough crowd. Um, she literally flew in a man on her own dime to join her in that just because she knew and it was still very bad. And then she had to keep, you know, navigating it and people are like willing to pay you money to like, to, but, but what's interesting is, and this gets to your point about attention virality is, the thing that's more nuanced is when she was doing all that fierce academic work, no woman ever stopped her on the street and like hugged her and cried and said, you've helped me so much. When she started scaling it back a little bit and giving a slightly more digestible, less hostile, like less here's the problem and just more here's the solution by itself, women would actually start stopping her on the street everywhere. Being because like, every woman me. knew the story about the first one. Every woman has felt it at their heart and probably didn't know what to do about it. Correct. Right? Because they know that that inability to operate. So, but let me, let me push this out. Let me just, let's, let's push this out a little bit more because I, I wonder if, if the, part of it is what you say. I agree with you. Part of it is like people are looking for simple solutions. Part of it is people are looking for simple, mm -hmm. right? There's a simple, easy answer to a complex problem. Yep. And how do you take from what she started off as a complex problem of something that needed to change, behavior needed to change, people needed to change, to the simplicity of it is just do the power poses. And so that was the easy sell, and that's what everybody wanted to pick up on. Yeah, I think that's correct, but I think part of what happened, I mean, as, as someone who is on book tour and is constantly being like, okay, but what are your simple solutions? I think I'm not simple, for a simple, one. <laughs> simple solutions have a well known plutocratic bias. I right. mean, I think that's one of my, like, yes, part of why people like simple things is they're simple, absolutely. But simple also means, often, solving the problem in a way that doesn't change power. Right. And that doesn't mean that part of why, and that's my whole story of women stopping around the street. Like, that's not fake, and those women aren't plutocrats. We're talking about like, working class women. And that really, that really got her. Like, wow, maybe I am helping more than if I, if I scale it back a little bit. But on the other hand, she knows why those women are having those problems, and they're not, and they're not having those problems because they like, failed to power pose right. before. They're having those problems because someone did something. And, and one of the frameworks I think about in the book is like, there are some problems in society that are like an engine where the dials are turned wrong. Right. And, we gotta, and, and you can solve it by like, turning the dials better and fixing this and fixing that, a little more of this, a little more of that. Great. There are other problems that I think are more like a crime scene. Okay? Someone did something to someone else. Now, you don't show up in a crime scene and say, guys, let's just move forward. <laughs> what's, the, let, what's the solution? Here? Let's just focus. Let's not be past oriented. Let's just, right? And that seems obvious to you, but like, I sort of think American political economy over the last 30, 40 years is a crime scene, not an out of whack engine. And if it's a crime, and I don't think that's always true, but I think in this period, when basically 90% of the gains of the future itself have basically been hoarded by a small handful of Americans, that is to me not an engine that needs to be retuned. It's a crime scene. And therefore, I don't know that there are simple solutions that will 
They're simple solutions that may help people, but I don't think they're simple solutions that will solve the problem. Yeah. Because the problem is actually requires you to look backwards, requires you to figure out who did it, how they did it, in order as the basic condition for undoing some of that. And I think part of what I encounter a lot, all the time, doing the work that I do, is people in these spaces, very, by the way, no one poor has ever said this to me. Um, interestingly, poor people have, I've never, in all my years of reporting in poor communities, like, I've never heard a poor person say, like, stay away from complex solutions. I agree with you. It's often very privileged people who are like, let's just do something simple, fast, that we can do now. Because I think they understand that you know, the kinds of solutions that would actually bring justice to many communities would take them down a peg. And that's hard. Yeah, and I, I would say, how do we think about, part of it is also behavior change, right? Like we elect governments for simple solutions, right? Donald Trump's a great example of it. But, you know, we'll build a wall and the economy will get better or, Obama was a simple solution, like, you know, we're going to collectively work together and make that happen. But it, required, it required a bit of collective rethinking, right, and saying we all need to approach the economy differently or we all need to approach, it requires changing mindsets and behavior. Correct. I remember being there trying to figure out how to get people to sign up for healthcare.gov. The world's most painful solution to get people to just sign up. The more young people that signed up, the more the system actually worked. Couldn't do it. Couldn't even get to 10% on campuses or anything else. How do we think about, in this world of simple solutions with complexity, how do we change behavior? How do we change behavior and people thinking about women differently? I mean, I think one of the secret projects of this book is to try to dismantle, I, th I think cult the exact issue you've named, the issue of culture, mindsets, I would also say language and vocabulary plays an enormous role in giving us bad ideas and obstructing good ideas, right? Um, so I go to a lot of events where people like basically want me to like tell them what the new marginal tax rate should be, <laughs> and I can't do that, uh, and I'm not qualified to do that. What I think I can do as a writer, and I think is actually essential for many of these things, is to dismantle a lot of the bad language that makes us think badly about yeah. solutions, right? So I'll give you an example on the Obamacare thing. I mean, I know how hard the president wanted that to happen, and I remember listening to him. Um, and I also remember that his language was often this language of like, we gotta bend the cost curve down. Right? Because there was this sense that you want to bring Max Baucus on board, right. you want to, and I get that. But like, part of me thinks that's part of this businessy language. language for things that actually sometimes makes an issue less exciting to your ardent people and doesn't even win over the people you're trying to win over. Whereas like, the idea of healthcare is as a right, the way someone like Bernie Sanders talked about it, I think is actually like, that's much, much simpler. Right. right? It's, it, the, the policy that leads to may not be very simple to implement. But I think like some of these big ideas that would actually change our society are actually very simple ideas. And some of the defense, bending the cost curve is actually a very complicated idea compared to like, healthcare is a right and we should just take it off people's minds. Right. Uh, the way in, it's off people's minds in many places in, in the world. So before I, I'm going to ask you the next set of questions. I just wanted to know, we are going to start questions in about 15 minutes, and we're going to start the line over there. So uh, please, in a, I'll let you know in five minutes before, but start lining up, and we will, uh, we will have you all come and ask questions, too, because I like asking you questions, but I think it would be much more interesting. Let's turn this to university setting. We're at Georgetown. You've spoken at other universities. How do you think about this if you're a student graduate. Actually, you, you interviewed somebody here, Hillary Cohen. My entire Cohen. first chapter is about a Georgetown, Georgetown student. Right, Hillary Cohen. Um, how do students think about this, right? Because they're being trained here both on the social justice as well as the market, as well as all of this, and they're bombarded with information. Yeah. How do you think about it as a student? So, you know, I told you a moment ago that one of my um, guiding lights in the book was to try to write this from inside people's minds as they were navigating this and not throwing rocks. So 
I wanted to start like where this, this culture that I'm describing of market world, where it begins. And I think where it begins is often on campus, where you have people arriving with a great deal of idealism and actually having that idealism stoked further by reading Aristotle and Plato and all this stuff. And, um, and so Hillary Cohen is a, is, a, is a unique person who in many ways is not a unique person. I think she would resonate with many of your examples and I, you know, I read campus op-eds all the time, people still grappling with this issue. So, so Hillary Cohen shows up here in, in the fall of 2010, graduates in 2014. And if you just look at that, those years, you can't ignore the topic of inequality and injustice in American life, right? The Piketty book comes out in that period. Black Lives Matter is born in that period. Um, the, you know, particularly for here for Georgetown, like the, the new pope arrives in that period and there's all the, you know, the, I've read in the Hoya, like there's all these articles about like people, longtime critics of inequality on campus feel vindicated by new pope. It was like a funny article about that, you know? And so, <laughs> like this is the issue, right? right. The Tea Party, in some ways, like a right-wing thing, critique of inequality. I mean, so you, it's a lot going on. And Hillary, like many of her peers, can't help but feel like, I got to do something about this age I'm living in. She's a privileged person. She wants to change the world. And slightly inflected by kind of business culture, she says, I got to change the lives of millions of people. Great. And the, and the story is, how did she go from that to an internship at Goldman and then a job at McKinsey? And the story is a story of tremendous, those companies have a tremendous and often unopposed influence over seniors making up their minds um, that like legal aid or various forms of civil society that you talked about or the government or the New York Times where I used to work are just like not there. Mm -hmm. Often don't have a lot of jobs to offer in the first place, just aren't there. It is, I'll tell you in journal, it is bewildering to figure out as a 22 year old how to become a journalist. Bewildering. It is really easy to figure out how to become a banker or a consultant. And so a lot of people end up as a banker or a consultant, not because they want to be a banker or a consultant, but because you take the thing that is like coming to you instead of the thing that you have to, you know, hustle like a, like a, you know, mafia don to like figure out how to get into. Um, and so Hillary kind of makes that choice. And then she ends up, you know, as soon as she gets to McKinsey, she realizes it's not for her. She'd been pitched on, you're going to change the world, you're going to like fix Haiti with this thing, and you're going to advise the Vatican, we got this part of the Vatican. Um, turns out that's not what she's doing. She's like helping companies be better, which is great work, but it's not what she wanted to do. Um, and so she's about to leave, and she gets a call from the only client in the world, the only potential McKinsey client in the world, who could have made her stay when she was about to leave, which is Barack Obama. Um, he's about to leave office. He's setting up a foundation. He wants to revitalize democracy and civil society, make us take power back as the people. And who does he go to to advise them on the setup of that work? McKinsey. Um, Senator Hillary's like, well, I guess if he thinks I should be here changing the world, like maybe I should. And then she goes in this whole thing. And she stays and she works on the project. Eventually she leaves McKinsey to go work for his foundation full time and then she moved on again to, to work at Stanford in ethics. Um, but the reason I tell her story is, and I saw some of you in that age demographic maybe recognizing this, I think young people need to recognize it. And I, I don't think it's fair to you that you're on the receiving end of a very well-marketed onslaught that frankly I think your universities ought to protect you from much more effective than they do. I don't think this is like a, like many things I've said today, I don't think it's a personal problem. I think it's something that, you know, um, is framed as a personal problem that you need the fortitude to oppose, but actually it's a systemic problem. Um, I think universities could absolutely level the playing field by limiting those information sessions and by making sure there are other kinds. I think if universities assertively called the New York Times and said, even if you don't have jobs, come and talk to our students about how they can get into journal. Like, that could be made to happen. It doesn't happen. Uh, we do I think have careers for social good that, uh, that we do bring nonprofits and, and folks to come here. So to be fair, uh, please start lining up. <laughs> but so what I want to say, you know, so, so I often get this question. I'm getting like 10 emails a day from young people in college like, OK, so what do I do? And I think one answer that I would have, it's a complicated issue and it depends on whether you have debt or you don't. It depends on a lot of personal things. I can't speak for all that. But I think one thing that's important to think about is this story that you have to apprentice in consulting or finance to make a difference 
in anything else. How do I put this? It is bullshit. Um, it's simply not true. It's not that those are bad. You know, it's, they're just, it's just the most arbitrary idea in yeah. the world. I think there's like a lot, like, I don't know, seafaring. Seafaring an interest, has an interesting set of mentalities. Being a pilot, being an accountant, you know, uh, being a journalist. I mean, being a journalist, you go and you listen to 100 people and you try to figure out where reality is. Like, that's a good skill. I, I just think the idea, being a teacher in a, you know, public school in the south side of Chicago and figure out how do you get authority over those 40 kids on day one unless you lose the whole year. Like, all of these are very useful skills. Yeah. And I think the idea that there's like a couple, th you know, I mean, I, I think the Hoya had this piece of 47% of students or something in one year went to consulting and finance. Like, that's just too much. And so what I would say is, if you can swing it, like, go do weird things in the world. Like, go to another country, you know, go run a hanger, hamburger joint in China. Like, go learn how to actually do something. If you're from a background where you haven't interacted with people from a lot of different backgrounds, like, go interact with them. Go nation build in America. Like, just get out there. And, um, and, I, and I really do think universities could play a very big role in shifting students' calculus of what they do and changing what's prestigious and changing who gets to access students' minds at that moment of vulnerability. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. You know, it's been very interesting for us to learn because we do these internships for students um, both over the summer called GU Impacts uh, that go domestically and internationally to go work on projects. And one of the things that we learned when we first started was they didn't like undergraduates. So there were lots of options for graduate students, no options for undergraduates. So we had to fight the system to get people to take undergraduates. Now we have 80 people that want to take you know, students to go work on projects. But it, it was a four-year battle to convince people. And, and DC is a hard place, I will honestly tell you. Like, government agencies do not take undergraduates. Correct. Um, and frankly, nowadays, most of the, other than consulting and, and investment banking firms, undergraduates struggle finding jobs. Yeah, that's why I think the world is an interesting yeah. oyster. Yeah, it's a great, <laughs> it is a good oyster. Um, I would like people to ask questions, but the way we decided to do this is rather than me sit here and they stand there, they're gonna come sit here. Wow, I like and that. And ask you the like question that. directly. Let's do it, let's do it. So, I'd love to do some, make sure we do some gender equity in, that, yes. in those questions. So we so. will start with, come on up. And please give your name and ask the question. I love this. I'm Aaron, hi. How you doing? <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a junior at Georgetown in the School of Foreign Service. So my question was um, when you were talking about Goldman and saying they're kind of fighting both sides of the battle, what that made me think of is like, in my mind, Goldman is not going to become a nonprofit, right? Um, so would it be better for them to have the nice things that they do or not? Because, like, and, the, and, and when you were talking about Georgetown itself and, and the career opportunities that presented to us as students, I mean, again, and me as a junior looking for internships and stuff, um, it that as well as what's happening at Goldman seemed just like the inevitable force of the market, um, like, okay. right? So it's, I guess my question is like, how do you fix that profit-seeking motive without doing something to alter like the market? Okay. Uh, there's no such thing as a free market. And this is certainly not one of them and it's never been, okay? Like, there's, I mean, I, you, there's just a lot of things you can't do to make money, like kill people or enslave people or, or discriminate by race or, I mean like, when, when has this been a free market? This is always a regulated market. The question is what are the regulations? And at certain points in our history we do a better job than others of government providing some order to reality. At, you know, when people worked in factories and belonged to unions in high numbers, we had eventually evolved a system where we could like control the hours and make overtime, we figured out a system. Then the work world changed and people now work on an app and a gig and they are, flexible hours and their hours are changed without their knowledge and all of that. And we just like haven't figured out how to adapt our, it's not like we can't, it's not like we're impinging on the free market. Like we were impinging on the free market before. It's just a question of the market's always gonna be doing new things and be dynamic. And for the sake of the common welfare, we just have to bring what we do together up into line with like what we do alone. Goldman, you know, I think the interesting point about Goldman is, like, is it inevitable? Well, I think it's not, nothing's inevitable, but I do think 
a very important issue that we should talk about is the way shareholder primacy is currently interpreted as a matter of law, there are real questions that many companies have. I don't think this is what is constraining Goldman, but there are companies that do want to balance concern for shareholders with concern for the society and fear that if they do, they would be subject to shareholder lawsuits saying they're not maximizing shareholder value. B Corps are trying to create a legal framework for companies voluntarily to have the protection to do something different and factor in wider stakeholders. More importantly, to my mind, Elizabeth Warren a couple weeks ago introduced a bill that would require every company in America to be a B Corp, which is to say, to factor the social good and environment into, and that would actually, in some ways, make it easier for these companies to function, and have, provide clarity, it may make them less profitable. But it would, it would reduce some of this guesswork around how much social good should you do to burnish your reputation. It would say, you have to, you have to account for more than just your shareholders. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. It's uh, wonderful to see you, and it's so and I'm a huge fan, so thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, share a little bit of uh, my uh, question and then also a perspective. So uh, my question has to do with entrepreneurs. Students, I think, so I'm in government, and I'm going to ask the management next for social good. And, I think that there are nuances for entrepreneurs that they have to uh, shape shift when they're speaking both in their respective industries, whether that be investments or entrepreneurship, technology, philanthropy, or diplomacy, or wherever that they may be. But there isn't really an incentivizing structure in each one to be this black sheep to talk about social good in each one sometimes. I have people in hedge funds wanting to uproot it and wanting to do, make a difference, but they feel like they can't make a sustainable lifestyle or a career if they continue to pursue it. And so there is this, I, I truly believe that the trend is moving towards sustainable good and, and creating value. 54% of the last generation care about purpose rather than 88% um, today. I think people buy with purpose. People do things because they care. There's, uh, yes, why, sorry, thank you. How can we really leverage this, this um, purpose and passion for people who want to make a difference when they're in their Accenture or um, some consulting jobs? I mean, I sympathize with the person who goes to a hedge fund and complains that it's hard to live with purpose. But when I say I sympathize with them, what I mean is I don't sympathize with them. <laughs> um, like, I just think these people are not being hard enough on themselves. You really want to live a life of purpose in a time of extreme pain and inequality where half the country has lost the opportunity to get ahead through the American dream. Like, don't work at a hedge fund that's flash trading commodities and putting pressure on companies to cut their pension bills. Like, go do something else. Have the courage to go do something else. There goes my chance to work at a hedge fund. Hi. Hi. Um, so I, my name is Jen Collins. I'm a fellow at the Beck Center. Uh, and a little bit of background, I fit the mold of everything you're describing. Ivy League graduate, worked in private equity in Manhattan, and I'm now um, looking at systems change with Sonal. So that's my background. Um, and I'm wondering about the invitation and advice, especially to the student population, about going at, to China and working at a hamburger joint or going to Africa to spend time in the slums. And I'm wondering what the advice or the invitation could be and should be for the students especially to be where you are and make change or impact or connect at the local level now, especially at a precious opportunity like Georgetown, where you have all of those places in the world represented in your dorm room. So it might be a bit of a uh, promotion for your wife's book, which is all about the art of gathering and how do we really make meaningful connection where we are. But I'm just wondering in your research and, and, and in your dialogue, how you think through that, especially as an invitation yeah, to the student that's body. A great, that's a great question. You know, it's something I think about a lot. So I actually, I mean, I kind of believe both what I said and the opposite to some extent. You know, and I, I think they're not, they're in tension with each other, but they're, they don't have to be because life is long. I mean, so I actually do think for many people who have not experienced a lot of the world, it's really 
productively destabilizing to like go away. When I say the world, I mean for many people going to West Virginia would be going into the world, right? So it didn't have to be, inter I'm not talking about necessarily crossing a border, I mean crossing a border of your mind, whatever, whatever you know versus what you don't. Um, but I, I really agree with what you said also, which is that I actually think there was a, you know, I, I wrote a column about this a couple years ago that I, I knew way more people in America who had like an interest in working on Kenya than in Kentucky. And I think it's safe to say that our neglect of Kentucky, I'm using Kentucky somewhat metaphorically, but our neglect of Kentucky has now given us a president who's made things much worse for Kenya and everybody else. And the world order would have been better if more of us had been paying attention to Kentucky um, because now foreign aid is getting slashed. You know, just the entire like post-war order that every country, including Kenya, benefits from is being shattered. And I often, you know, raise this question about like many of us um, participate in all kinds of big national online movements. We're getting national alerts on our phone every day about what happened next in the dumpster fire, and like have not attended a local community meeting in years, right? Um, and I think. When I say the, the, the call of my book is a call to return to politics as the place we go to change the world and to change where we go to change the world. And a lot, the easy pushback is like, well, Paul Ryan's there. How can we do that? And what I try to remind people is we have 89,000 government entities in the United States. You can't take two or three dysfunctional ones and say you can't do anything. Um, like, Way too few people of the kind of people who are in this room and go to a university like this, way too few of us run for county council or county executive. Way too few of us work at every level of this society to actually try to embed those value hedge fund purpose into actually like the systems that we share in common. Um, so I absolutely think that, that figuring out ways to embed in your own community um, absolutely needs to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Hi. Um, How are you? I'm Chelsea. I'm a sophomore in the SFS. And my question kind of connects to the last question. And basically, I'm just wondering would or how would elites ever make the right change that you're talking about when I mean, I'm talking from a elite perspective when we have no connection to the core of the problems people are trying to solve, no matter, I don't know, going to some place in Africa that you've never heard of and trying to do something that really does not connect to the core of the issue. And I don't know, like, I don't think interacting with the local community is enough for an elite that's never lived that life to understand. Um, what is happening or how to find the right solution to the problem. And even when you go local, it's you're going to a local community that's not part of your life. So Right. I, to to right. be clear, I'm not suggesting to go out into the world as like, how do you make change? That was my answer to like, what do you do right after you graduate from college if you're confused right. and you're told that you can only do one or two things? All I was saying is open that up a little bit and like, go have a weird couple years doing something that may not add, lead to something or add up to something. Just go, I'm not talking about like become a change agent in a community you've never been part of. I'm just saying go like have experiences that give you a broader view of the world. In terms of, um, yeah, so go ahead. Sorry, just pushing back on the experiences, wouldn't the experiences contribute to what you were talking about, the keeping the status quo because I don't know, the volunteerism or the white saviorism, whatever it is, I'm not wouldn't that but contribute? But you're, you're putting words in my mouth. I didn't tell people okay. to go be saviors. I didn't say go make social change in countries you've never been to. Right. I said go like work in a hamburger joint in China and like right. learn about people you don't know and learn, like destabilize yourself. I just think as a human experience, being taken outside of context you understand and not trying to run them, just trying to like right. be in them is a very important experience. Right. Uh, to your, the earlier part of your thing, you know, how can elites make change? I mean, I think that's the, the puzzle I try to explore right. in the book. And I'd say a couple things. I think there's an overall idea of like, it's very hard to. It's, it's certainly if you're in the vanguard, it's hard to be a leader of change that will make life harder for people like you. That's, 
you know, um, that, that's why men weren't in charge of the women's movement um, and shouldn't have been. Um, but there were some men who participated. Right. But what was really important for men to do was to stop being in the way of it. Right. Right. Okay? So I think that actually provides us an analogy. I think the most important thing that a lot of the winners of our age can do, people always ask, what can I do in, the, in, in those elite spaces? What can I do? What could I start? Right? And that question also has a bias. Because you know what that question isn't? It's not asking, what am I already doing? How am I already involved in this situation? And often, it's the case that the way you're already involved through what you're complicit in or through what you're part of is part of causing the problem. And simply pulling back from being an active cause of the problem actually may be the more valuable thing you can do rather than like starting some initiative. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, great to have you here today. It is a very, it's an important conversation. I'm a, a retired foreign service officer, was a U.S. ambassador to Armenia. I'm now a fellow and a, a faculty member here, adjunct fac faculty member here. Uh, my basic question, you've, and you started to answer it with the last few, so uh, I have a little bit less of a question and perhaps more of a comment uh, in, in, in what I'm going to say. When I, when I saw your TED Talks, and you have given several TED Talks, when I watched Two. your TED Talks Two. today, <laughs> And, and I haven't read the book yet, but, I, but based on what I've read about the book, uh, I, I, what I found missing was the so what. The so what for an individual person. Uh, the idea that you know, the problem is the capital, capitalism, or the problem is the system, or the problem is whatever. If, is the so what that we should all vote in the midterm elections? I agree, we should. Uh, or does it mean we should overturn capitalism, or we should end consumerism? I mean, the so what for individuals? What, you know, we want to do crowdfunding, we want to do Kiva microloans, we want to do stuff that an individual can do. Some of that is market-based. Do you discourage that? Can't there be win-wins and all these kinds of do what you can do at the same time Your you question have is very a funny. job? The fact that you didn't find what the so what is, but also didn't read the book, is, did. you did read the book. I did not read the book. No. Right, so one of the reasons you may not have found what I say on that is because you didn't read the book. Um, and, and, and there are gestures and answers in that direction, but I am with um, that very famous feminist saying that there are no personal solutions at this time, there are only political solutions. Um, and the point of that saying and that slogan was that certain kinds of problems, when you try to ask, the whole book is an attempt to dismantle the idea of the win-win. And the, the reason the win-win is problematic is it argues, essentially, that the powerful must benefit from social change. It's, 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 it's a nice sounding idea because what it sounds like is the poor should benefit from the, what the rich are enjoying. But what it actually deeply means is that the only good kind of social change kicks something upstairs. And I'm trying to dismantle that. So uh, yeah, there's a million win-wins. Is Kiva going to help somebody in Detroit? Yeah, probably. But that's not what's wrong with Detroit, and that's not what's going to fix Detroit. And if you don't understand what happened when all the white people moved away from Detroit and hoarded all the money for the schools in Royal Oak and all those other s suburbs and how they screwed Detroit, like a Kiva alone is not going to fix what they did. Trying to understand what they did and trying to reimagine the social structure of Michigan is important. And I'm sorry if that's not like something the CEO can do on Monday morning. But most of the most important things that have happened in our history were not something the CEO could do on any morning. And I'm comfortable with, with pushing us to do those things anyway. Now I'm not going to get a job at Kiva. <laughs> um, thanks, so much, so, thanks so much for joining us. My name's Ian. I'm a senior in the School of Foreign Service. Um, my, Question, I, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to do uh, what seems to be one of your favorite hobbies, and that's pissing off people that you're talking to. It's <laughs> great. Um, great. So, like <laughs> I'm actually a very nice person, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about big firms, Goldman, McKinsey. Um, I was wondering if you could put it more in the context of elite universities as well. Um, and the, you know, they're obviously uh, a very, uh, pointing criticisms about how elite universities can uh, distort educational opportunities for those who can afford it. 
um, do elite universities do enough to bring themselves into the into the black, as you put it earlier, for net social worth? No, I think it's a very important question. Like, I mean, and then this, the historic stuff that Georgetown did around its slave past is like a very interesting example of like what it looks like to start moving from a palliative approach to that issue to like a much harder approach. Um, but yeah, I mean, universities are ground zero for this because the amount of money that now has to be raised basically puts universities and, and frankly, activist groups, anybody who's got to raise that kind of money to survive is, is essentially a dependent. And that's what's crazy to me. Like, it really bothers me at some very deep level that an institution like this should ever be in any kind of dependent relationship. Um, or on the wrong side with, with like some guy who made a lot of money in hedge funds, but it happens and it's very hard to protect against. And, you know, so when people give $100 million and put their name on a center, I mean, they're deciding what kind of center they want. The university is not deciding whether we need an engineering center or a science center. I mean, some universities may push back a little bit, but generally if someone has $100 million for a science center, like you get a science center, right? Like, that's kind of a problematic thing. So one of the conversations we had yesterday that I think is very interesting is that newspapers may provide a certain kind of model for universities, activist groups, others. Newspapers, you know, particularly in the US, have actually solved this problem of how do you take money from rich people and reassure them and have them know from the beginning that you have no power over editorial, essentially. Right? Um, I was talking to a colleague of mine last night, a former colleague at the New York Times, who's like one of the four guys investigating Trump for the New York Times in a very serious way. Um, and you know, he was saying, like, even someone like him, who has such a capacity to influence where this country goes, like, the idea that anybody would ever call him from any, like, and just, like, it just doesn't happen, right? Because you know that, like, the, that call's not going to be taken. Right? So the New York Times has advertising, it has rich subscribers, it has all kinds of partnerships, but like no one would ever call a reporter and expect anything from that. Well, I think a lot of universities and schools and active would do well to actually learn from that and just, be, I think it's actually easier to take the absolutist position, right? You can give us money to our university, you have no say where it goes, your name will never be on it, and we will do with it whatever we want. You can give them whatever size you want, it just goes into a pot and we run our university. Now, would you get less donations? Yeah, and maybe you should be willing to, to live with less donations because that gives less, people less power over an institution that I don't think they should have power over. Thank you very much. Did I succeed? Yeah, well, we'll yeah. see. <laughs> hey there, thanks for being doing? here tonight. I apologize for my speech, a little mumble, I had my wisdom teeth out this morning. So. Wow. Well. <laughs> Trying to recover Congrats. from That's, that. This is heroic that you stood up, <laughs> you're here. I mean, yeah, talk about lean in. <laughs> so I'm curious, you know, like as a senior in the School of Foreign Service, you, know, you spoke about, you know, like Amy, when she wrote these papers that called for what a lot of people see as like radical change, you know, it didn't get any traction and it wasn't until she kind of made it more moderate that, you know, like the word was spread. Or you being here, you know, with your book, in a lot of ways is enabled by, you know, having worked at McKinsey and New York Times, you know, so like how do you think these more like, I guess, radical ideas and ways we can really like systemically transform society, how can they gain traction when so much of society is calling for them to be like moderate? I mean, I think that's a very real issue, but I think on the other hand, there are, I think we need more of the winners of our age to be what FDR was, which is like, you know, a traitor to his class. And we actually, one of the paradox, like we have so many people who are so rich that they can afford to be traitors to their class. If, if you have $10 million in your bank, you can't afford to be a traitor to your class, right? You're like, you're close enough to the line that are, you know, if policies really shift, like that could come down significantly, right? If you have $150 billion, you are, are like free to really think about what would make the world better in a way that's like not self protect Just keep a billion for yourself in, in a New Zealand on property with a runway cl closed off. And then, and then like you can just actually, we have people who can afford to be really daring about system change. And part of what I would urge 
folks like Bezos and Gates who are, who are doing important work moving v many needles, but who often shy away from like kind of aggressive system work that would, that would you know, that would in some ways um, challenge their fellow winners is like, if not you, then who, right? Gates and Bezos can afford to be traitors to their class. So for example, Gates does a lot of stuff on education. Some of it's very good. A lot of it raises questions about who is he to decide how people's schools go, right? A lot of it is there's questions of how much power should one person have over public schools. So all those are real questions. But I think his heart's in the right place on many of those things. Um, but here's something I'd love Bill Gates to do, okay? There are, in this country, we do something that I think no other rich country probably does, which is we fund public schools according to like the home value of mommy and daddy's house. Well, this is a really dumb way to fund, I mean, it's not, sorry, dumb is not the right word. It is an unbelievably barbaric way to fund public schools. I'm not sure that there's any other rich country that does it this way, right? And the idea that you give people the most education if they come from the biggest homes and the worst education if they come from the you know, cheapest homes, I mean, it's just insane. So, like we all know that. I mean, I don't think many people in the society would stand up and explain why that's the most just system. Um, I don't think Bill Gates would probably think that's a particularly just system. Well, there are some court cases right now. That, that was lost in the Supreme Court in the early 70s, but that's a long time ago. That could be overturned. I mean, maybe not by this court, but that's the kind of thing you gotta spend 20 years farming a case, right? The way, the way it happened with the marriage cases and whatever. Um, putting a billion dollars, again, I have concerns about how much power anybody should have over anything. But if you're gonna spend it and you're gonna have that power, putting a billion dollars into farming those cases, recruiting plaintiffs, I mean, that takes a lot of years, right? The marriage cases, I don't know, it's 10, 15 years. Like, that's the kind of thing where if you got that Supreme Court ruling and you got it ruled, that funding public schools at different levels according to is unconstitutional, every public school in America would be different overnight. You wanna talk about scale? That's some scale, right? And I think that's, tr but that's traded to your class work. And that's the kind of thing where some of these really, really uh, rich guys and women, I think can, if they were brave enough, support things like that. Um, that the people worth $10 million are gonna be like, why are you doing that, man? But would be very good for the country. Great, thanks so much. Thank you, good luck with your recovery. <laughs> Hello. Hi, my name is Oranima. I'm a junior in the college. Um, my question is, as I was, you mentioned earlier at the very beginning of how uh, people or how this is an age of a lot of generosity and also a lot of inequality. Um, but it made me think of, you know, I, have, I had a professor who was a grad student who gave away like most of his salary to charities he had researched and had never bought a shirt. He just had things that other people had given him and it was incredibly like selfless. He was not in that shirtless way. though. He was not shirtless. Right. He was not shirtless. Um, but most people are not like that. Um, and so in terms of looking at you know, is there something, could you elaborate on, is there something unique about this particular time and place in history about why people are especially trying to do good things, but kind of, you know, keeping themselves at the top? Yeah, or, it's or a very is interesting question. Just, is it just as simple as, you know, over t like all of history, people are just in general a little selfish? That's a great, that's a yeah. great question. So I, I want to say the following. I think there's a continuity and a change. There's, some, there's a, an element of this that's always true, and there's an element of this that's specific to our time, okay? So the element that's always true is people with a lot to lose are self-preservational. That's just, as you say, that's obvious. Why wouldn't they be? Um, and if you think about, how many of you watched Downton Abbey at any given time? You know, or there's like any number of things like, we think about that world. Right? It's sometimes easier to see when you take it out of your context. Those are very generous. The Lord and Lady Grantham, they're generous people, right? If a serf on the edge of the manor had a child take ill, you know, they would bring them into their house and tend to them. If, if someone fell behind on their rent on the manor, like, no big, you know, they, they would work something out. They were never, like, as, I mean, there may be some exceptions, but in general, in that show, like, at any opportunity to, to be generous, they were generous. Um, they were kind, they were nice people. 
what they did not question was a society in that period where there were lords and ladies who owned all the land and like no one else owned any land. Right? So I think that's just an eternal dynamic of like the lords and ladies in the, in the castle are never going to be like, hmm, what should we do with the land distribution? And so other people need to, do, to raise those questions. And they may relent in their resistance, but they're not going to lead the search for that solution. Okay, so that, and that's the eternal dynamic. The dynamic that's specific to right now that I think is very interesting, not only right now, but certainly right now, is that extreme inequality has two interesting effects. Number one, it raises the, because we're not, like most people are good people, it makes us all want to do something, right? Um, you can't read about inequality as often as we read about it and see the evidence and hear that you know, only 50% of Americans out earn their parents down from 90% some years ago. Like, you can't read that and think, eh, I have no involvement in this. Most people are like, gonna, particularly if you're a person of privilege, are going to respond to that. So that's why you get the generosity, because I think people are kind people reacting to you know, cruel facts. Um, but extreme inequality also has a second consequence, which is very familiar if you have lived in the developing world where you have extremely unequal societies. The cost of not being elite becomes much higher under periods of extreme inequality. There's no middle anymore, or less and less of a middle. What that does is you're either up here or you're down here. It's less comfortable in between than it used to be. Right? I, I remember in reporting my last book, there was, I went and stayed with these two public school teachers in a small town in Connecticut, and they were in their 60s or 70s. They'd spent their whole career teaching in public schools. They had this like, big old house in Connecticut. Then I went to their bathroom. I see those pictures on the wall. There's their second house in the lake somewhere a couple hours away. There's the boat they owned. And I remember thinking, no one in my generation who teaches in public schools is going to have a big old house in Connecticut and a second home and a boat. Like, America has changed in a way that's hard to appreciate. That is a fundamental shift. And that thing of like, so in their, in their time, if you're in the 1%, great. But if you were like in the 20th percentile or whatever they were, you know, you could still have a second home and a boat. That's like not going to happen anymore. So in a way, Extreme inequality makes it really important to help, and it makes it really important to not give up your spot. And I think that's where this dynamic is born. The desire to help, but the desire to stay in your spot. OK. You got to make your students less smart. <laughs> so uh, my name's Alicia. Um, you've been talking to all these bright students with great ideas and warning them how Goldman is going to lure them in with a promise that they're going to shape their mindset so that they can achieve all their dreams of helping. And you talked about how there are many other professions that could shape their mindsets better, like teaching or sailing or whatever. <laughs> Uh, but I want to challenge that because you keep mentioning careers and I feel like there's more in people's lives that can change their mindsets and make them better world changers than just careers. I fully agree with that. I mean, part of why I... And then could you, like, elaborate on that for them? <laughs> right. I mean, part of what I, what I was talking about when I said go out into the world is to be less careerist. Because the, the idea of going, whether the world is, as I said, West Virginia or China, the idea is actually to like, delay getting on that career ladder, delay doing something that is going to lead to something that is going to lead to something, and actually invest in like, destabilizing your own consciousness and having experiences and making friends in other environments that are different from the environment of your birth. And that's that, I, I said that precisely for that reason, as the alternative to the careerism that doesn't start in college, it starts in high school now. I and mean, you have people in high school starting to like frame themselves and market, think about their personal brand, and it's all like, this stuff is just... High school. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> this stuff is reaching down way too far. And we actually have to like protect the space of being young and like bumping into walls and trying weird things. And, and, um, and so I am fully on board with your plan. I think the whole idea, of, and it's not just moving somewhere, it's just spending time having experiences that destabilize and grow you as opposed to put you on a path. There's plenty of time to get on a path. Hi. Uh, my name's Harsh Dubey. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. And um, you talked about how it's important for, you know, maybe some fabulously wealthy elites who can be traitors to their class um, in sort of changing the system. My guess would be that you can't rely on something like Correct. that. And so is there a sort of long-term fix? Can you have a long-term fix while you still have elites, or do you need something more, a little more radical? I mean, a lot of the things that I think would put America on a different path are at one level very hard to do. If you think about how would you pass that in Congress right now. But at another level are not that hard to do in that like a lot of other countries do them already and they're actually not big mysteries. And part of what has actually happened is there's an ideology that tells us that the kinds of things that the winners don't like are hard and the kinds of things they do like are easy. So just like a, an example of this that I love is like throughout the 90s, you had a lot of financial deregulation. It's the 10th year anniversary of the 2008 crisis right now. That led very directly to creating conditions that allowed that crisis to happen. You know, when that financial deregulation was happening, right? These are you know, thousand page pieces of legislation. It's, it's a complicated thing. I don't think you ever heard business people saying, God, it's too complicated to deregulate finance. It's just too complicated. It's so complicated. It's, God, what a complicated issue, right? When you wanted to reverse the same things, which basically, I mean, it's the same issues. It's just the opposite answer on, suddenly it's like, gosh, it's so complicated to have government involved in this, right? I end the book by talking to this Italian political philosopher, Chiara Cordelli, who's brilliant. And she says, you know, the winners of our age often have a, a sense of agency, an idea of their own agency that is kind of fraudulent in two aspects. One, it's fraudulent because they say there are all these problems that are too hard, but that they're, they're entrepreneurs who are constantly saying they can do crazy things that no one can do, but suddenly, like universal daycare is just, oh God, that is so hard. Really? Like 18 other countries have it, only our country created Facebook. Like, I don't know, I think like if we could do Facebook, we can do universal daycare. Like, I don't know, I, like the idea of what is classified as hard and what is classified as easy is very weird in America. Like we can go to space, but we can't do universal daycare. It's like, it's very bizarre. Um, we can colonize Mars, like people are working on that. We can do life extension in Silicon Valley, but we can't have a healthcare system for everybody. Like just notice what gets othered as difficult and what gets called easy. I would again argue that there's a bias to that. Um, and so I would urge young people to like think freshly about what is actually hard and what's actually easy and don't get, don't get kind of fooled by other people's self-interested stories about how you should make the world better. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, wait, I, I wanna bring the table up so we can get your book signing and we have to leave here by seven so I'm, I had to cut the questions short. But let's thank Anand for the talk. Thank you. And, and, and he, will, he will come up here and sign the book. So if you just want to make a line, we will, uh, we will have a book signing. So can you, um, just before everybody leaves, like this is a super important conversation for us to be thinking about how do we actually have agency ourselves to do something too often we're always looking for someone else to solve that problem, right? If there's anything you take away from this book, think about what your own personal agency is. Even if you go work somewhere, what is your personal What's agency to do something about it, as opposed to waiting for some system to change for you? And that is actually a very important part of why we hope to have more talks, more interesting conversations, but how do you think about that? So um, I would pull this in a little bit more, please. <laughs> so I, I think, um, 
as you leave here, think about what it is that we can do together. What is it that each of you can do yourselves, but not feel unempowered to do something about it, because it is about our own empowerment. And I certainly hope you will come to more of these for the Beck Center and, and join us more often for these types of talks, but also challenge our, our own institutions and our own organizations as well as ourselves on are we doing what we want to do um, and how are we doing it well. And that is a part of discernment. So thank you, thank you for coming today.